Wow, thank you, Deirdre, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you so much for being here tonight. This is just, it's unbelievable. It's surreal. And, and Safia, thank you for, for your time. Although, face it, I mean, you, you get to get out of the house for a couple of minutes. How great is this? Thanks. And you're looking awesome, I too. I brushed my hair today. You did? Good for, for you. Yeah, was, good girl. Good <laughs> can everybody hear OK? Just yell from the back if you can't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can. And we know where awesome. the heckling stick section is now All right. as well. And this, this is not vodka, but that's in the book. <laughs> At one time, it might have been. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I can't give too much away. Well, already we've started. Uh, let's call a spade a spade. No matter what brings you all here tonight, whether you are a Lighthouse family, whether you've recently experienced grief, or whether you are some of the many in the audience, the majority of the audience who have followed Aaron for decades, you will all leave flying a little higher tonight. Because, folks, a true uplifter is here with us. Aaron Davis, you came to uplift and uplift you shall. Thank you. Um, you are family to much of the crowd here. But will you start off by telling us about those events, May 2015, that okay. changed your life forever? All right, I will do that. Um, it, was, uh, it was a beautiful morning in Jamaica. It was a Monday morning. It was just the hours after Mother's Day. And, CHFI winners had joined us just the day before, and we would do these listener trips a couple of times a year. And Mike and I would go down there, and I had this little magic trick. Um, on the plane, on the way to, to any of the listener trips, Rob would have really sort of the digital version of flashcards so that I could memorize everybody's name. So I would go, Melissa, Sean. God help me if they weren't together or if they changed their glasses or their hair from the time they came into the station to pick up their airline tickets. But uh, that, was, that was kind of my little trick. And, and um, after those events that day, my memory kind of went like that. It's part of the, uh, the cloak, the, the, uh, the gift of shock that sort of befalls you when something like this happens. But uh, everybody had arrived. We had a Mother's Day cake and a reception. And then the Monday morning, people were up. Not quite as many as in this group, but there was about 80 people all gathered in a big ballroom on a beautiful, humid morning. And if you've been to the Caribbean, you know all you hear in the dark are the tree frogs, and everything's kind of wet, including the floors. It's funny, the things you remember. But we were sitting at this table, and my sweet Rob, who's, uh, ah, yeah, there we are, who's, who's running pictures for us here tonight, um, he, he, one of our promotions people came up to him and said, uh, there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a phone call for you from, from Toronto. And OK. So Rob got up and went to the lobby. And I'm sitting there. You know what it's like to be preparing for a broadcast. And you've got 10 minutes, and then we're going to go live from to, back to Toronto and, and you know the live morning show. And he didn't come back, and he didn't come back. And I thought, well, where's Rob? That's what I said. And then got up from the table, went out, sort of high-fiving everybody with my coffee mug and saying good morning to the sleepy folks who had joined us on their vacation to watch a radio show. And um, out I went to the lobby, and there sat Rob on a bench across from the front desk, and he, his shoulders were slumped. And I said, what is it? And I, and I named an in-law that I thought might have gotten sick or something, and he said, it's, it's Lauren. She died in her sleep. And I don't remember really what my reaction was at that point. I know that it was, of course, I probably no, but I couldn't be loud about it because it was so quiet and everyone was sleeping in this hotel and the, the cavernous echo of the, uh, of the lobby. And they had prepared this little room at the side uh, where you stow your luggage if you want to play for the day. And um, we, they, they had uh, offered to send us to that little room. And I said, no, no, we were fine, because you always have your show face on. It's just something and I'd always surreal. had. Yeah, it is. And then I went back into the ballroom. And, and Deirdre referred to, to doing the show from Jamaica. I went back in um, and sat down after I told Mike Cooper, my partner, and our producer, I said, well, Lauren died. And, and they both just swore at me because they thought, you know, don't even joke about something like that. And then I sat down ready to do the show because there were listeners waiting, there were advertisers waiting, and it was just, I, I, you know, saner heads prevailed and, and had me leave. But uh, I wasn't, I don't know if I was really going to do the show, but it was the place where everything felt normal. 
course. in my life. You just go back to that little cocoon where everything was the same 10 minutes ago, and, uh, and you can focus on something other than, you know, kind of the tsunami that's coming at you from right outside the hotel. So that, that happened. Lauren had, uh, had died in her sleep. She just didn't wake up. And, uh, and it was the day of her baby's seven-month birthday. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's what happened. When I read in the book that it was just past Mother's Day, yeah. the profoundness and the heartbreaking qualities of the fact that she had just spent Mother's Day mm -hmm. with her son, and you not being in the same area code, in the same country. No, not even, you know, it, had it been Toronto, of course, we'd have gotten in the car right away, but it was all too late. Uh, her husband, Phil, awakened her, tried to awaken her to her baby's cries, and, and there she was, just uh, slumped over the side of the bed. And um, the coroner tried, tried so hard to determine what it was that killed her and was unable, although he had a very good idea that it was quite likely a drug that she was taking to help her to breastfeed that uh, is banned in the U.S. is, uh, yeah, I heard the because I say that too, um, uh, prescribed with care in the UK. But here, you can get it like cheese samples on a Sunday at Costco. And it's called domperidone or motilium. And uh, it's very commonly taken. And I am not uh, linking the two because I don't want to lose everything that we have. Um, but what I will tell you <laughs> is that all I am asking is that new moms who, ha who struggle with breastfeeding um, uh, just get their hearts checked to make sure they don't have an abnormal heartbeat. Uh, we believe because Rob has a very slow heart, uh, heartbeat that uh, maybe Lauren had the same thing and it jumped in between the beats and just stopped it. So um, that's, that's what we believe and the coroner tried and tried. Maybe there will be a test along the way. They've still got, they've still got uh, some of her tissues to, uh, to uh, to, to test, and it's not like I'm looking for that precious word closure and everybody here who's lost somebody knows that for the most part, that's BS. Um, we throw that word around. I know, we like really we do. we know what it's like. Episode's over, time to move on, time to get over it and, uh, and, and go to the next thing. Um, it, it, we're not looking for that closure, we're just looking for something to help other mothers who might be just so desperate to breastfeed in this age of, well, you know, the mommy bloggers, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do that, you and if you're not breastfeeding, mom. you're, you know, you're not a mother and take away the child, or, uh, you know, she already felt like she hadn't quite lived up to the standard by having a cesarean at the, at the last minute, it was an emergency C-section. So already she was carrying the stupid damn weight of social media on her shoulders, mm -hmm. And we tried, and there, she, was a, she was a very headstrong young woman, and I knew enough, you know, when Lauren says, okay, mom, that's enough. Um, there, was, there wasn't anything I could do except to suggest any other natural, uh, natural aids, but when we heard about this drug, you know, and everybody's taking it and it works, it sounded like a miracle. When I first learned a little bit more about this story, mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to read much of the book because of how much I resonate with the stage that oh, well, Lauren course. was in. Of course. But I have to tell you what an amazing job you have done keeping her memory alive in a positive way. And Thank that you. kept me going, that optimism in the book. She's here with us right now. Let's, oh, talk, let's talk about her for a minute, you know? <laughs> that, yeah, that was the happiest day of our life after the day that Lauren was born. That was October 11th. So he just turned five years old, little Colin. And uh, he was born in Ottawa. So it was Thanksgiving weekend. It was Saturday evening. And uh, for some reason, Rob and I had decided to have our turkey dinner early, and there it was about 5.30, and we were done, and she, got a, she phoned us and said, you want to come to Ottawa? And we said, do we? So uh, off we were, and then a beautiful, low-slung orange harvest moon guided our way all the way there until we got to about Perth when her husband called and said, Lauren's going to be having a cesarean. And oh, okay. So uh, he was very worried, but we were, we were sure everything was going to be okay. And this little boy came out with... He was kind of, his, his feet were, were blue because uh, he'd, he'd had the umbilical cord around his neck, but uh, his giant feet, like his dad. And, uh, and so there he is, and he's just, uh, he's just a, a gorgeous, wonderful little boy. And I would, love to, I would love to know that if he was older and had suffered through that, oh, oh, oh my uterus. Be still um, our hearts, be still our hearts. I know, hearts. right? Yes. Those eyes. Oh, I know, I know. And they were blue for the longest time, and they turned to Hazel, and we thought, he's going to be the very first blue-eyed Shirakawa in the world, because <laughs> his dad is a quarter Japanese, but uh, no, they've gone, they've gone Hazel now. 
But, uh, she yeah. will live on through the book for him. Well, you know, Safia, this is I part really of my... I really got that feeling. I got to know her through the book. Oh, thank you. And, you and really, your memory. I, I'm, I'm optimistic that he will because anyone can Google anything now. And there will be, if you, if you Google my name, and I'm not saying I ever have, media people don't do that. <laughs> um, uh, the first thing that comes up is Aaron Davis's daughter. Well, after me, it comes up Aaron Davis's daughter or how did Aaron da Davis's daughter die? Um, because it's just one of those things. I think now we put two and two together and many of us come up with, uh, with drug overdose or, or so many of the, the ways that our, our children die in the 21st century. So he is going to find out about it and it's not gonna be a big secret now anyway because why have I got extra grandparents, you know? Um, and so I just wanted this More book. More love. Well, exactly. More love is exactly. not a bad thing. But the logistics of it, how come, uh, you know, there's mommy, he's got a new mommy, and I'll get to that. And there's daddy, and then there's these two, grandma and granddad banana, which is what we call ourselves. I'm grandma banana, because grandma Marnier was a little bit too, you know, <laughs> maybe one day. it's very sophisticated. I know. Yeah. So uh, we wanted him to know Lauren through this book. And and certainly, you know, the, the, the rear view mirror sometimes is... is uh, you know, pretty glossy, but, and, and our publisher said that, you know, be sure that you mention that, that your memories are going to be very special and sweet, um, but she just was special and sweet. She really, really, truly was. And as you say, a large but short life. So then when you talk about how vibrant she was, a, you know, radio personality in her own right, yep. very successful in her own right yep. in Ottawa for Ottawa's 580 News, and you talk about the large life that she lived, how frustrating was it at the onset of her death to then not have that cause at first, to not have peace with that fact of it at first. I, I assume you've made peace with that part of it. Well, yeah, there's now. a lot of acceptance, Safia, that comes with, with the gift of time. And uh, you know, if you go through the Kubler-Ross, one of them is acceptance, although that is for the people who are dying that she came up with these five steps. Mm -hmm. um, in, in our case, as those who are grieving and left behind, the, writing the book was the acceptance. And also just coming to know that, no, we weren't going to know what killed her. And would it make a difference to us? It might make a difference to other mothers, you know, if we can possibly get that word out so that nobody mm -hmm. else has to lose their child like this or lose their life like this. But um, it, it, it really, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that, that that was that frustrating for me. There was just so much, so much else that was going on. Let's talk about that turmoil. As you mentioned, the tsunami was about to come at you. Mm -hmm. Nothing felt normal. Getting a drink of water probably felt strange, no matter Everything. where you were, yeah. except maybe for one place, one place where you would put on your headphones and you'd yeah. be back into a bit of normalcy. What was it like going back on the airwaves at CHFI after Lauren had died? It was exactly one month to the day, as it turned out, June 11th, which was Colin's eight-month birthday, and my dad's actual birthday. So I just thought, okay. Auspicious. Yeah, well, 11s are big for me somehow. I don't know, it sounds silly, but, but they just are. And um, I thought, well, if not now, then when? Because there were some people who, who thought that I was never going to go back. Um, I don't think I was one of them. Because as I mentioned, in the, in the very moments after learning that Lauren had died, that was my safe place. And so I could go into this room with Mike Cooper and our producers, Ian and Gord, and uh, Steve Roberts, our newscaster at the time, and just feel like I was with family and it was safe. And, and although the first few weeks, it felt like I was a scuba diver and I was running out of air and, and was just trying to get up to the surface. And I would come home and just, you know, clothes went off in a trail to the bedroom. And, and then I would just kind of sit there and try and catch my breath. Um, it, it was the place where I could laugh again, and, and gradually people came to be hearing me healing, and that's, that was when sort of things started to turn around, because I thought, okay, I've, I've, not, I've got this, nobody's got this, but I can do this, at least I can, what are you looking at? Oh, and, and I got the same necklace on, it's ELR, Aaron, True Lauren, family. and Rob, yeah. yeah. And there's our sweet, sweet Mike Cooper, my work husband. And the sex is about the same. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> He's like, I've heard this joke before. I know. He loves when I make fun of him and he can't even get back at me. <laughs> anyway, yes, go on. So it wasn't just the work family, though, that carried you through this. Oh there my God. is a larger family 
part of which is here right now. You couldn't fit them all in one room, but the listeners helped carry you through that healing process too, I can imagine. You spoke in the book about all of the things you receive. Now we think, we don't realize what a, what a role somebody like yourself has in the living rooms of the nation. Bedrooms, Somebody bathrooms, said that. Somebody said that. Living rooms of the nation. The day. bedrooms of the nation. <laughs> there you go. Politics and radio hosts have no place in the bedrooms of the nation. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yes. But, but people really have lived these lives along with you all, and they made sure that you knew it. They made sure that they knew that they were carrying this grief along with you. It was the most astounding thing and something that Rob and I will never, ever truly be able to thank everyone for. Um, because they heard I was pregnant when I was on the air with Don Daynard, and that was from the window of the bay. Oh my God, how we used to freeze sitting in that window at Young and Queen. <laughs> Whose idea was that? John Hinnon, who was my news director and hired me at CHFI, he's back there. He's, he's uh, volunteering with Expedia, I'm working with Expedia because they, they are linked in with, uh, with Lighthouse. Uh, so Hinnon, I know it wasn't your idea, it was somebody in sales. But um, yeah, so that's when we announced that I was expecting, and then she was born in March. And uh, so a week after that, I did my show from home. Like we were talking about how long this. were you off? How long are you going to be off? No, it was one week and that's only because she was born three weeks early and they didn't have the, the line set up in the house yet. And people would hear her cooing, I bet. Yes, and... in fact, I did hear from more than one mom who said when Lauren would <laughs> cry on the air, she would lactate. So, <laughs> sorry about the other people on the go train, lady. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so that was that was really, really gratifying. And then she would be on the Christmas Eve show with Rob and with me and with the whole CHFI family. And uh, and then, of course, when she got engaged, she came, and when she was going to have a baby, she came into the studio and told us about it on the air. And so she was really part of our yeah. family. And everyone felt like they knew Lauren. Um, she was very good about us talking about her on the air. There's the difference between the private and the personal that my radio guru taught me, and I would try never to go personal with her, but, or private with her, but you know, to share stories of parenting that were universal. Um, so everybody felt like they knew Lauren, and then when she died, uh, one of the stories that I tell in the book, and I will never, ever, ever forget this, was hearing of a woman who pulled over her car because she had heard that morning, um, that when they announced it on the station that Lauren had died and she pulled over her car to cry and someone pulled over their car to help her and see if she was okay and wow. they stood outside the car and hugged. I mean, it's just, I heard that from someone who saw it happen and I couldn't believe it that in this city, this big GTA that we, we consider to be so cold and impersonal mm -hmm. that people could be brought together by something like that. And it's because you have worn your heart on your sleeve for decades. Well. It's your heart that that everybody is feeling and thank you tell us a little bit more about the reaction some of the listeners like a prayer blanket prayer blankets emails. more than one more than one and and cards we sat out months later two months later out on the deck on a sunny summer day and opened up the cards one by one when we felt like we were ready to you know what it's like when you get people signing the book at the funeral home and you don't know if you're ever going to open it again but um uh, yeah, just to, to read those cards and then to, to get the emails and it got to the point where it was December of the year and she had died in May, but that December, the week of Christmas when I didn't want to be doing anything else, no. I sat and made sure that every email was answered because these people had given me a part of themselves in, in sharing how they felt and their grief and their own loss in a lot of cases mm -hmm. um, because we don't talk about loss. We don't, it, we don't, we don't feel like anyone wants to hear uh, that our hearts are broken and so we all put on this brave face and this armor and that is what I've tried to do with the book is to help people to deal and to, to speak the language of loss I, even if you haven't lost someone how to how to uh, talk to an alien being like me or like anyone who has lost because the worst thing you can hear is someone said yeah and I went back to work and none of my coworkers said anything and it's not it's not malice it's just not knowing what to say and it's, uh, it's understandable because we've all kind of been there. But, you know, do you think that we're going we're gonna to crumble if you mention our loved one who is gone when they're right there all the time anyway and, and you're wearing everything except a scar down like a Harry Potter scar on your face as, as Anderson Cooper and, and Stephen Colbert put it in this beautiful interview they did. You should Google it. It's on YouTube. It's wonderful about grief, because when she died and we were in Ottawa, I felt like I wanted to, I wanted to dye my hair silver or, or cut it all off or something, and it, just, it was the silliest impulse. Um, 
just to, to show the world that I'm not the same person anymore and I never will be again, you know? But, but here we are, here we are. We all kind of pull our pieces together and grab the spanks and the lashes and life goes on. <laughs> The fact that you have these listeners helping you carry part of this grief, it speaks to organizations like Lighthouse, right? Oh, to God. know that you're not alone. Yeah. But then there's the other side of the coin too, and this really, really surprised me, is the fact that you had to not only help people understand your grief, but defend it. You had to defend it to those who accused you of hiding the true reasons why she died. Oh, that woman. So you had to you had to defend why you were back on the air so soon. Yeah. Like, forget talking about not even knowing what to say, but then going a step farther and saying completely the wrong things. Well, yeah, and, and I kind of debated whether to include those sort of dark side elements of the book, because we all have these. If you have any kind of success or happiness in your life, there's always going to be somebody who's just trying to just take you down a notch where you belong. But celebrities are, are not untouchable. You are real people. You are a real person under that show. And I would even argue celebrity, if I'm a celebrity, I don't know, because I've always just kind of been me on the radio. But um, yeah, it, uh, I, I'm, there, there was this horrific, horrific letter from, from a, a person, and I don't know if it's a man or a woman. I, who, that I included in the book just to show you how, how bad things could be. They basically said that, you know, to me, success was everything. So now, now you got what you wanted. You, you're paying the price. Um, yeah, I know. It, yeah. But, Robbie, raise, raise your hand if I should mention that letter, that email that I got two weeks ago. He's not, oh, he's going to raise it. Okay. I got an email from a guy that I know I've heard from before. He was mad at me a couple of years ago because I was in Niagara on the lake and, and uh, writing journals about it because they paid me to do that and I made it clear I was a guest of the Shaw Festival. But I kind of recognized his email address and he said, wow, making money off your daughter's death. Boy, lady, you're a fucking piece of work. I know, I know. So all I could do was not respond. But now that's because I am serene and calm and sober. <laughs> and um, I didn't respond. He said, and for my first response was going to be, you idiot, nobody makes money off of writing a book. And it, <laughs> but <laughs> that was going to be my response. Um, but I didn't respond. I sent it out to two girlfriends who just got furious for me, and they didn't respond either because I did. <laughs> Don't let this guy know. If you're here, please, sir, I'd love to meet you. We, um, all, we all have something to say to you, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, there's always, 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 no matter what you do, and I don't have to tell Lisa, listen this, because she's like superwoman in the business world, and, uh, and she always tweets and writes positivity, and she's just, she's just amazing. Um, but there's always going to be somebody who tries to take you down. And uh, I'll be honest with you, from the moment that HarperCollins asked me if I would write this book, mm -hmm. because it, I didn't come up with this idea myself, there's no way I was going to write my story, send it out to 16 publishers and have them go, no. So um, uh, the moment it came to mind, I thought, is anybody going to think that dot, dot, dot? Because we're all so conditioned, especially in the media, where are, you change your hair and you get 19 emails, you know, um, that, that somebody's going to try and, try and you know, eviscerate you. And, and, and it hurt me so much, that email two weeks ago that I just, I got right after I'd finished doing my speech at a conference for the Ontario Association of Cemetery and Funeral Professionals, who are great. <laughs> uh, they were wonderful. It was quite an undertaking. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, and so I was feeling pretty good. And of course, asking my questions like, how could that have been better and all that? And then I get that email and I go, why are you in my life? And you know why? Because for, for all of this light, there has to be the darkness to, to, to make the light shine and, and, you know, I don't know. I liken it to the lighthouse. You don't need a lighthouse on sunny days, you know. So that's, that's I guess, what I'm doing with, uh, with the, the responses. And people thought I wasn't, I was giving a bad example, showing a bad example by being back on the air a month later. Um, because, like, there are people who get, who, who are just completely taken down and never get up. And I understand that. I do understand that. But this is just how I had to cope. This is, this is what I had to do. And, and maybe, you know what, I don't know if you guys believe in psychics or not. And if you don't, that's okay. There's just one woman who, 
who told me that Lauren would be born on the 11th and that my mom would be with her on the 11th and all of these different things. And this was long before Colin was born or anything like that. And she's a lovely woman and a friend. And, um, and she said that Lauren said, Mom, it's not about you anymore. It's about them. And even if it hadn't come from a woman that I you know, paid for this reading, it, it, was, it was a good reminder, it's a good message that it isn't about me, it isn't about Rob. It's not why Melissa's coming up tonight or why Lisa's going to join us or why you're here on your mat leave, sweet girl. Um, <laughs> that, that it isn't about us anymore. And if it was, oh, what would it all be for, you know? We all wish these stories didn't happen, but the fact that you're all here, others will be helped in the process. We all wish it didn't happen. Yeah but the ripple effects of what you have done and even just what you all are hearing tonight is huge. But I think we need to talk about how others who are in the grieving process deal with the judgment oh. from the rest of the world about how appropriately or inappropriately they mourn. There's no linear process. There's no five-step program. Mm -hmm. There's, it's not pretty. No, no. And, and I think that that's a lot of what we come to expect in our society is that, you know, every time you open an article, it's like eight ways to have great orgasms or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, you know, or six ways to, to look better in two hours or, or all, these, all these little things that are so fast and, and, and instant cure-alls. Um, but there is no, there is no timeline. There are no steps. There are there are road. There are, are signposts that we are expected to kind of observe. However, vaguely, like if you're in complicated grief, then you really do need to get help. If you just, if you if if you seem to be at a place where you're just not moving forward or maybe even regressing. So there are a lot of signposts, but absolutely no timeline too. I mean, the, there are. I included a. a a blog in the book from a woman who said, pardon me while I grieve. Uh, and, and her friends were saying, it's been a year. Don't you think you should start dating? Or when are you going to get rid of his clothes? Or all of these things. And conversely, oh, you're doing it too fast. Which is what we easily could have thought about our son-in-law uh, when we found out, in a very funny way, uh, that he was dating only a few months after Lauren had died when really this is what we had hoped for him. We wanted for him to move on and find happiness so Colin would be happy because what was best for Phil was going to be best for the baby, right? So we're in Phil's house and um, we'd been going to Ottawa every couple of weeks after Lauren died so that there was a horrific flood in the house she died in. It didn't, that wasn't what killed her, but it was uh, like a month later, Phil was here in, in well, he was actually in Mississauga. Uh, recovering with his family and Colin, and their house, their little townhouse, suffered a horrific flood. Oh, no. Devastating. Oh, no. So that happened Father's Day, because we love Mother's Day and Father's Day in my family. That happened Father's Day, and he didn't find out about it until Canada Day. Oh, God. So the place was a disaster. So there's Phil now in a two-bedroom apartment in downtown Ottawa with a baby, and we went to visit, and there was like uh, baby food on the walls, and just because you had seen just how how... Phil was struggling. He kept doing um, cloth diapers and kept making the detergent because this is what Lauren had done and this is what Lauren had done. And so we would go there to try and, you know, go out, have a life, get out there. And so he did, and he met a young woman that he had worked with uh, in a previous incarnation, and she was suffering through grief as well. And so um, we found out about it when we were visiting Phil, and I wanted to make sure I had this newfangled text thing under control. And uh, so I got this, I texted him, we got it back. He texted me, um, have a good night, honey, make lots of money. And I thought, mm, I'm not dancing tonight. So I had to give that up when my tassels were better for cleaning the floor. But anyway, um, so uh, I went, oh, I said to Rob, he's got a girlfriend. And I just, it, my blood ran cold. But when we stopped and thought about it, well, of course he does. And that's a good thing, and it's a wonderful thing. And now, just three weeks ago, Colin became a big brother. So I don't even know what picture's up there. Oh, there's Phil, and there's Brooke. They got married um, la a year ago last summer, and, uh, and there's Colin. So, and, and actually, the thing is that uh, baby, there she is, Robbie, you're really good at this. <laughs> Um, this is baby Jane, and she actually looks so much like Colin when he was that age. So uh, it's going to be a wonderful thing, and we get to be her grandma and granddad banana, too. 
Yeah, we'd love to hear about the Grandma Granddad Banana. They're all still in Ottawa. You still get to see the, yes, the whole gang gonna, often. Yes, we're going to see them as of uh, this next, like a week today. And we're going out for Halloween with them. Um, yeah, he's going out as Woody from Toy Story. And I don't want to take up too much time here. Just, I got to tell the Toy Story story. From the time that she was a child, that was like our movie. The, the first one and then the second one, which was kind of meh. But the third one, when Andy Davis goes off to, to college and gives away the toys, Lauren was going to college at that time too. And so we found it to be, you know, just, oh God, we'll never see this movie again. And it was, uh, you know, just, just tears. And, and she saw the movie with, with us too. So that was the end of that. And then Lauren died. Then Toy Story 4 comes out, and we're like, no, we are not going to see this movie. But we were in Ottawa two weeks ago, and lo and behold, there it was at one last cinema, the Imagine Cinemas. and Waiting we, for you. Waiting. Waiting and for you. And we took Colin to his very first movie, and it was Toy Story 4. And he was great. It's like you say, you find solace in whatever world is around you at the moment. Well, it's true. And, it, you know, it. All we can do is choose the way that we want to go on um, because life happens to everybody. But uh, Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, which is an amazing book, he just said that it's the last of human choices is the ability to choose how to go on. And I'm not ever going to judge anybody for how they choose to go on. I chose to be uh, comfortably numb through uh, some, of the, some of the aftermath of Lauren's death. I'm not judging anybody. All I'm doing is what I can, and uh, hopefully, hopefully helping out other people on the way. Hopefully. One of the things that irked me, as it irked you, I'm sure, uh, when I was reading the book, was yeah. the fact that people would say, at least when it came to Colin, ah, you know, at least you still have Colin. At least. at least you have this. Let's talk about the at least, shall we? Talk about patronizing and oh, gosh. minimizing. But you know what? You know what? The thing is, people will say the most the thing that they, that they think is going to give you comfort. People don't know what to say. No, and that's the thing. That's why we're here, is people don't know what to say. What do you say when there are no words? And it's OK not to have words. It's OK to say, there are no words. And Rob and I would say, that's OK. You're right, there aren't any. But just to know that you're, you're feeling for someone, or my heart goes out to you, which is, you know, why Olivia Newton-John is on the cover of the book is because that was the song that she and Amy Skye and uh, Beth Nielsen Chapman wrote the morning Lauren died because I knew Amy Skye and they were all sitting together at the kitchen table in Los Angeles at Olivia's house. And she, Amy got the, the text and she said, oh my God. And she said, I don't know what to say to her. And, and they said, well, what do you want to say? My heart goes out to you. So then they ran off to the piano and wrote this wow. song, which was the opening cut on uh, their Live On album, which is about grief and mourning. So uh, what to say? At least we heard them all. At least you still have a husband. At least you have a grandson. And the at least are the things that do hurt the most. But the at least are for us to say, because they're part of the blessings that we count. At least she didn't suffer. Someone said that to me and should have had a throat punch. But I can say it. <laughs> Right? I can say it. At least she didn't suffer. At least she left us calling. At least her heart didn't stop when she was driving a car. You know, there are so many blessings to be counted, but we, the bereaved, get to count them. Yeah. That's our little gift, right? Do you see all the Kleenexes that you're counting out there right now? <laughs> Thank you for being so real with your story. And it's not just what you experience, but it's also your internal story as well. Can we talk a little bit about... Oh, go ahead. You've been very, very ah. open. Yeah, can pull, pull up a comfy chair, everybody. Ask me anything. You have been very, very open with the fact that you used alcohol to numb some of the pain, the litany of all these losses. And then you went and, and were able to seek help and were able to unearth some pretty deep feelings. Yeah. Thank you for not sugarcoating this because it is not a pretty process. No, it sure is not. Um, I... There's a lot of a lot of drinking in radio. Uh, it's one of those businesses and television. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't mean you. And look at you. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God, woman. No, um, no. And you know the media in yeah. general. Any yes. any business where there's a lot of stress and pressure and, and deadlines. Deadlines, yes. And uh, and you know sometimes working with or for monsters. Uh, all of those things can can combine. 
to, to put a lot on your shoulders. And, uh, and I had a lot on my shoulders at a young age. And um, alcohol was just kind of the way that I could deal with, with working with somebody who wasn't always happy that I was there in the morning. Um, and that was my first co-host. He and I had a wonderful relationship, but uh, I, I expected too much from him. I wanted him to be kind of my father figure, or I wanted to, anyway, it's a, it's, that's a whole bunch more counseling. Um, so that's, that's and, and I also, I, I found myself uh, targeted by, by other men at other radio stations who, who made fun of my looks and made fun of all kinds of things about me. And I think they were all try just trying to be Howard Stern in the way that he treated so many people. I understand now he's on the redemption tour and he's do he's, his book is outselling mine, so I can't say anything. But um, uh, he, he has realized that, that he was a real you know, jerk. Um, so anyway, I was the target of that kind of stuff and I didn't know how to deal with it. So you know, there was my friend. A gray goose, and, and it just made everything kind of better until it didn't. And I stopped in July of 2005, July 2006, 2006. And I, and, I, and I had 10 years of sobriety, right on through including Lauren's death. She died in 2015, and, uh, but it was just the week that I had announced I was leaving CHFI. Rob and I were on a plane taking a little vacation. So it was November 2016. And uh, I ordered a virgin Caesar, and I got one. And then um, I guess you can't have a virgin twice. So the next one, <laughs> he gave me a Caesar, and it had vodka in it. And, uh, and I went, oh, OK, let's see if I've got an off switch. Which it turns out that if you're an alcoholic, you don't have an off switch. And the, uh, the addiction, you could stop here and live your life, but the addiction just keeps mm -hmm. going like that. And when you're ready to open it up again, it's there and it's ready to, to take over. So that was the week that I'd announced that I was leaving and that Donald Trump was elected. And so I just, I just ran out of dams to give. And, and so <laughs> I, uh, I left radio about three weeks later, moved out to the West Coast, didn't have to get up at three in the morning anymore, didn't have deadlines, didn't have people who were expecting me to be bright and, and, and on top of things. And so I just, I just delved into this. So I would write during the day, and then, um, you know, about 7 o'clock, it was, it was time to, to start drinking martinis. So that's, that's how I conducted myself until this spring when I thought, okay, this is stupid. This is really stupid. I'm starting to forget things. Um, I'm, I'm looking much older than my 38 years. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's a preservative, but not that good. Uh, so I... I um, I decided to check myself into treatment, and I did six weeks, and... <laughs> so brave. <laughs> Thank you. It was not at all, like I have this friend who, who thought it was like, I don't know, some sort of a spa, some sort of canyon ranch. It was not canyon ranch. <laughs> it was sleeping on little hard beds and, uh, you know, lining up for meds and, and uh, doing all of that kind of stuff that... Um, uh, there were days I didn't wear makeup. Can I just tell you it was that serious? <laughs> it was. Uh, and that's what I said to my counselor, the day you see me here without makeup is when you know I'm really starting to recover because I had this mask on all the time, mm -hmm. you know, dance monkey. So um, that's, that's what I did and I've come out of it and, and you know, one day at a time. So that's, that's also my story, but I don't, you know, I can't proselytize about it because it has anonymous in the name. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm here if anybody asks about it, you know, how does it work for you? So that's how it works. Like we said, it's not a linear line, right? There's no straight up and down. Oh, hell no. Tell us about the decision to leave CHFI. You oh. mentioned the mask. You mentioned all the things that happened yeah. with the, the tsunami of all those changes during that week. Yeah. Well, it, it actually came, um, there, were, there were a number of changes. Lauren died in May of 2015. February 2016, Mike Cooper took leave of the show. He said he, he had to resign because he wanted to spend more time with his terminally ill wife, Debbie Cooper, who died a year ago today, my angel. Um, <clears throat> so Mike left. I lost my favorite, favorite dance partner of all time with Mike Cooper. He, you know, he, we were just with him a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you know, you taught me how to be real on the radio. And I said, no, you already knew. I just, I just, I just gave, you the, gave you the opportunity to do it because he was there for me in every way. And we would laugh and we would cry. And it was just, oh, it was so magical. So when Mike left, it was like, oh, another death um, in a way. 
And then uh, we brought in Darren, and it was, you know, he's, he's a great partner to Mo, but I didn't have it in me to, to learn new dance steps or to, to just try and try and show somebody how, how, what I needed in order to be real on the radio. So I just figured, you know what, Bill Blass, the designer, used to say, know when to leave the party. And I, and I had a feeling it was time to leave the party. So CHFI very generously let me out of my contract, and, uh, and Rob and I moved west. We left everything, everybody, all our friends, our whole, my career, Rob's hockey buddies. Um, and, and we left everything, and Colin in Ottawa, but we kind of rationalized that by saying we can do Facebook mm -hmm. once a week. Uh, we can do, you know, five or six hours of flying driving as opposed to a four-hour drive, and we can still be with them. And they needed a chance to grow. Phil had moved on. Didn't need the ghost in-laws over there, you know, kind of as the... Uh, the ghost of Christmas has passed in their lives. Uh, but that being said, they're wonderful to us, and, uh, and, and we, we love them very, very much. Because grief is just love with no place to go. And if you can, if you can find a way to open your heart, and I didn't make that up, I wish I had, but you can, you can if you put it on Twitter, just say I said it. Um, <laughs> but it, it, if you get a chance to love again, whether it's a child or, or, or a fiance or you know, anyone that can, can help you to, to open up the fullness of your heart, why on earth wouldn't you take it? Our lives are too damn short. Reclaiming joy. Yeah, well, absolutely, right? Aaron Davis, folks, a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wonderful job.